Uh, good evening, folks. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm just going to um, wait a couple minutes and we can get started. I want to give folks time to get in. As well, I'm going to pull up a quick presentation that we're going to give about Alrighty. While we're waiting for folks to uh, get in, I am going to start with um, some introductions and a quick um, presentation. It's going to be purely informational about uh, the Richmond Land Bank. So let me go ahead and introduce myself. I am Flora Valdez Tapena. I am the Richmond Land Bank Coordinator um, for the Maggie Walker Community Land Trust, um, which is the organization that operates the land bank. Um, I am going to be sort of leading this um, meeting along with Sharon. Um, and uh, this is a meeting of the Citizens Advisory Panel. We're going to be discussing some um, former city surplus properties this evening um, and talking about um, what should be done with them. So I'm gonna go over a quick presentation about the land bank and what it is and how it works. So, um, the land bank primarily deals um, with tax delinquent properties. Um, the ones we're talking about tonight were not tax delinquent, they were surplus, which is a different thing. But primarily we deal with tax delinquent properties. Um, the city of Richmond has a lot of tax delinquent properties. A lot of them um, are currently auctioned to the highest bidder in order to make back um, those lost taxes. Um, but just one in three of those auctions um, between 2010 and 2017 were ever rehabilitated or developed. Um, the remainder sat unimproved, unused, or vacant, um, which is a common contributor to what people call blight. Um, so what a land bank does is we come in um, to this process of um, you know, tax foreclosure, auction, um, speculation, and vacancy. And we take properties out of that by instead placing properties in the land bank after they've been uh, tax foreclosed, um, doing some work to clear their titles, um, and then um, figuring out what would be the most productive use and, and finding someone to use the properties that way. Um, so the specific priorities of the Richmond Land Bank are affordable housing uh, is our number one priority. Um, we also prioritize commercial uses, open space, agriculture, and other things depending on the needs of the with these properties that we're going to be talking about tonight, the only permissible uses based on the city's uh, mandate are affordable housing as well as community gardens. There are over 250 land banks in the United States. Um, Virginia General Assembly passed the land bank and doubling legislation in 2016. The Richmond Land Bank was one of the first in the state. Uh, state there are three known land banks throughout the Commonwealth. Um, how the Richmond Land Bank works here is that the, like I said, the city um, takes vacant land that it owns and transfers it to the Richmond Land Bank. The Richmond Land Bank is a program of the Maggie Walker Community Land Trust. Um, the organization that actually owns the land is the Maggie Walker Community Land Trust. They also operate, we also operate an affordable home ownership program, which we'll get into a little bit later tonight. Um, after we receive those properties, they're reviewed by the Richmond Land Bank staff and the Citizens Advisory Panel to determine their best use. Um, and then we um, solicit applications for pre-qualified applicants um, who will submit applications to, propose those, uh, to, to purchase those specific properties. Um, the CAP then reviews those applications and transfers those applications or transfers those properties to a small fee to the applicant 
that most align the RLB goals and priorities as set out in the principal plan. And thus, a once vacant property is returned to a productive and beneficial use. Um, like I said earlier, our top priority is the creation of affordable housing. Um, Non-buildable lots, when we do have them, and try not to, but when we do have them, are available for our purposes, such as community garden and summer green space. <laughs> the Citizens Advisory Panel, um, the members of which are here tonight, um, are made up of nine members, um, five of which are appointed by the City of Richmond. Um, the chair is appointed by the CAO, two are appointed by the mayor's office, and two are appointed by the council. And the remaining four are appointed by the board of the Baggy Walker Community Land Trust. Uh, the Citizens Advisory Panel is intended to be a uh, line of communication between the public and the land bank. Um, this is sort of what our property map looks like so far. This was last updated in June of last year, uh, but we haven't received any new properties since then. Um, mostly what's changed is the kind of designation of some of these. Um, we have transferred 15 parcels of land so far for use as affordable housing. Um, we have transferred one for commercial use, four we've transferred to uh, a local uh, organization who needed it to, who needed it to maintain uh, some open space and parking. And then um, 10 we transferred to the Jackson Project for the Cape Woods River Homecoming uh, Center, which we are very excited about. And um, one, we have leased to Hand Up Community Resource Center to build a community pharmacy in Oceanside. That's just some of the work we've been doing. Um, and that is my entire presentation. Um, I said it would be quick. I promised it would be quick, and it was. Uh, here. <clears throat> now, let me see. Have we got our uh, fifth cat member here? Doesn't look like we have five CAP members here yet. Um, there is currently a vacancy on the CAP, so there's only eight members, but we try to have a, a quorum. Um, so um, Sharon, would you like to start by introducing yourself and then we can introduce the CAP members that are here while we're waiting? Certainly, thank you, Flora. Um, welcome everybody to tonight's meeting. I'm Sharon Ebert. I work for the city of Richmond as a deputy chief administrative officer uh, overseeing the city's planning and economic development portfolio. And uh, I am chair of the citizen advisory panel. Um, and with that, I'd like to um, turn it over to each one of the members that are here. And I, I think I will start with Sheba Williams. If you could introduce yourself, Sheba. Yes, um, good evening. My name is Sheba Williams. I am the founder and executive director of No Left Turns. Um, we're a Richmond-based nonprofit. I have been on the CAP board for three years. <laughs> um, I will turn it over to James. Hey, good evening, everybody. My name is James Lambert. I'm currently driving right now, so I apologize for that. But I'm a local Richmond, and I'm just very passionate about affordable housing. Thank you, James. I'm going to turn it over to Lynn to introduce herself. Hi, everybody. I'm glad. Uh, wow, this is a lot of people chiming into this me meeting. That's really exciting. Um, I'm Lynn McAteer. I've been on the CAP um, advisory group for, I don't know, maybe a year or so, Flora. I think that's about right. Um, and I've been working in the affordable housing arena for uh, 25 years, and I'm a Richmond resident. Thank you so much. And um, Flora, I don't see anybody else. Yep, um, that's a CAP member. Am I missing anybody here? Uh, not right now. We are, are um, just waiting on one or two more people to join. Um, in the meantime, um, we also have the uh, CEO of the Maggie Walker Community Land Trust here with us tonight, uh, Erica Sims, as well as our Director of Home Ownership, Candace Turner. Uh, and our um, home purchase coordinator, Elizabeth Munyon. Um, there may be a few other staff members who join um, just to say hi, um, but I will be primarily leading this meeting. Um, 
I wanted to, I guess I'll go over some ground rules really quickly before, um, while we're waiting for folks to join. Um, I want to, there, there will be a public comment period during this meeting um, for the applications that uh, we received that have been publicized on our website for about two weeks now. Um, there will be a public comment period. Um, during the public comment period, we ask, um, I will read off comments that we received on our website. If you are someone who commented on our website, um, please, um, you know, wait your turn. I will read off your comment. Um, if you have anything else to say, please wait until other folks have spoken first so that we can have a nice even balance of voices. Um, after the public comment period, um, the CAP will um, discuss the comments that they've heard, will um, discuss the evaluation that the staff has given and other things, um, and try to make some recommendations. Um, so, uh, and I really thank you all for, um, how much, uh, engagement you've, you've had with this. Um, it's been a long time since we have had a, a cat meeting this large. Uh, I know that there's some properties that, uh, some people feel very strongly about, um, tonight. And I also want to stress, um, tonight that we are not, um, <clears throat> None of the plans that you have seen that have been submitted are final. Um, things will always change um, in the development process. Um, this is the beginning of a process. It is not the end. Um, there will be more opportunities for you to be engaged in many of these um, many of these developments. Um, and so, you know, please uh, don't don't feel as if you need to. Um, get the last word in because there will be more opportunities. All right, sounds like Bill Cunningham will be joining us hopefully. And we can officially get started. Hi, Phil. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Sorry for my delay. No worries. Thank you for joining us. Um, this is Phil Cunningham, uh, another member of the Citizens Advisory Panel. Phil, would you like to introduce yourself really quickly and then we can get started? Uh, sure. Uh, Phil Cunningham. I am a uh, currently an employee with Virginia Housing, uh, working on the housing tax credit team. Uh, previously worked uh, with a nonprofit housing development um, here in Richmond, VCU alum. Happy to be here. Great. And oh, it looks like Chanel is also here. Um, Chanel, you can feel free to introduce yourself if you want as well. Hi, everyone. This is Chanel Dixon from the CLT. Great, Chanel. All right. Um, so um, the first order of business is minutes from November. Um, how are those minutes? Do those minutes look good to everybody? All righty. Um, then we can uh, mark those as approved by consensus. Oh, one more thing is that um, for folks participating, uh, the Citizen Advisory Panel is not a board of directors. Um, they make decisions by consensus. This means that everybody present has to agree. Um, so there will be no votes, but there will be rather a consensus. All right, um, I'm going to kick it off with a review of properties that we will be talking about tonight. Um, let me pull up our property map really quickly so I can talk a little bit more. <laughs> Alrighty. So the properties we will be looking at tonight are these blue marks on the map. Um, these three up in Northside, 
One is 207 East Ladies Mile Road. Um, it's an 80 foot by 130 foot lot um, near the corner of uh, Hazelhurst Avenue, Ladies Mile, and uh, Hunt Ave or Donovan Street. Um, it backs up to uh, a cul-de-sac. It is zoned R5 single family. Um, and we received two proposals for this lot that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, the other two are 3100 Alvis Avenue, um, which is a large parcel. It's about 507 feet by 125 feet or about one and a half acres. A lot of that is taken up by a resource management area called Cannon's Branch, which is a, a creek. Um, and so um, we will be you know, helping to subdivide this property into a smaller piece that can be developed <coughs> according to our engineer. Um, 3602 Delaware Avenue um, is another parcel in Northside. Um, this one and 3100 Alvis did not receive any application. Um, <coughs> there are some additional costs associated with it because there's some ownership disputes that we're resolving. Um, but otherwise, it is a pretty bog standard um, R5 single family lot. Right. That takes us to 1903 and 1905 Sims Avenue, um, which are uh, just kind of southwest of the intersection with Coward and Avenue um, in the Spring Hill historic neighborhood. Um, these two properties together um, are pretty large. Um, they're zoned for B3 business. Um, for which allowed uses include uh, multifamily housing as well as other things. Um, we received uh, three applications for these properties, um, one for uh, Commonwealth Catholic Charities, one from Project Homes, and one from Habitat for Humanity. And finally, there is 5913 Ferguson Road. Um, which is 137 by 150 foot, um, sort of triangular lot um, at the corner of Ferguson Road, and near near the corner of Ferguson Road and Somerset Avenue in the West Hampton Three Chops neighborhood uh, near the St. Christopher School for Boys. Um, this property has a large sewer easement running through the middle of it, um, but we determined that uh, it is partially buildable, so we elected to um, put it through this process. Um, to figure out um, what should be done with it. And we received two applications, one from 3000 West Clay LLC and one from St. Christopher's School Foundation. Now I'm going to go ahead and get into the <clears throat> actual application itself. Um, I'm gonna be reading off a document that is on our website um, as well as in the meeting materials. Um, if you'd like to, I can, uh, I will go ahead and present it here as well, just so everyone is reading off the same thing. So um, for 207 East Ladies Mile Road, as I've said, two applications, one from Habitat for Humanity. Habitat for Humanity's uh, application included one unit of uh, community land trust um, owner-occupied housing, um, three or four bedroom, depending on the family, um, 11 to 1,600 square feet, depending on the family again, and sales price between 165 and $240,000. Um, committed at 80% of AMI, committed to be affordable to a family at 80% of the area needed to come permanently through the community land trust. Um, the other proposal we received was from uh, an entity called Bell 4316 LLC. Um, they proposed um, four community land trusts across the small lot, um, subdividing it, size of about 1,400 square feet each. Um, <clears throat> Proposed sales prices of about $230,000, and again, permanently affordable to um, families making 80% of the area income or below. 
Um, and these applications are all on our website again, if you'd like to see more detail, um, but I'll be going into more detail with our evaluations. For 1903 and 1905 Sun's Ave, the project homes application uh, included um, 12 uh, owner occupied uh, CLT homes in a sort of townhome style arrangement side by side, um, attached or detached. Um, three, uh, three bedroom, two bath, 1700 square foot house um, sold for $205,000, which is a, basically a, a standard that uh, Project Homes has been building for Maggie Walker for uh, you know a little while now. Um, and again, permanently affordable to families at 80% of AMI or below. Then there's the application for Commonwealth Catholic Charities Housing Corporation. This application is a mixed use building um, including 20 senior uh, apartments for rent, each one bedroom, one bathroom, size between 570 and 710 square feet, rents between 428 and $995 per month, and affordable to 30 to 60% of area median income and restricted to ages 55 plus. Um, there are also built in space for programming. Um, you know, programming rooms that, where they would provide services to the residents there, as well as a ground floor retail space of about 1,650 square feet. Final proposal was Habitat for Humanity, who proposed um, two CLT home ownership units, um, each um, three or four bedrooms, 1,160 square feet, for sale between $165,000 and $240,000 each, um, affordable to 80% of AMI. Again, these numbers vary depending on the size of the family that have that elects to work with. For 5913 Ferguson Road, um, the application from 3000 West Clay LLC um, includes one um, cottage for rent, I believe one bedroom, one bathroom, and about 775 square feet, um, renting at $1,000 per month. Um, affordable to families making 80% of the air medium income or below. Um, it says no commitment here. I meant to remove that. Um, we did chat about it. Um, and um, uh, Mr. George, uh, who is the, the builder here, has agreed to um, be accountable to Maggie Walker, um, report his uh, tenant's incomes and his rents um, every year. So there is a, there is a, a commitment for 15 years. <clears throat> and um, this project would also leave uh, a lot of space on the parcel for a large food garden um, and a small shed. And then the other application we received was from the Ford School Foundation, who intends to use the parcel as a community garden. Finally, um, 3100 Alvis Avenue. Again, we received no application for this unit or for this parcel or 3600 Delaware Avenue. Um, and as such, um, MWCLT through an offer letter, a standing offer letter that we've had with the CAF, um, has agreed to build um, one CLT ownership unit um, on each. Um, we build um, between two or three bedrooms, uh, two bathrooms, 1,400 to 1,700 square feet, with sale prices between $175,000 and $5,000 approximately permanently affordable to um, families making 80% of the area median income or below. <sighs> now I'm going to pause one more time and I'm going to start with our evaluations and recommendations. Does anybody have any questions so far, CAP members? All right, cool. And I will bury ahead or barrel ahead, excuse me. Um, so on the first page of this, um, we've attached our um, development application rubric. This is from our, this is on our website, it's posted publicly. Um, we have four criteria, potential for positive community impact, um, thorough feasible plan for land use, alignment with goals and objectives in the land making annual plan, and commitment to permanent affordability. Uh, and projects can either not meet expectations meet expectations or exceed expectations in all three of these criteria. So we're gonna start with 207 East Ladies Mile Road, um, which is the one that I, I talked about first in the last uh, document. 
for uh, reference, once again, um, the application from Bell 4316 LLC includes four permanently affordable CLT owner-occupied units at about 1,400 square feet each, proposed sales price of $230,000. Um, we rated this one on uh, community impact uh, meets exceeds. Um, they did cite some MDA statistics showing increased risk of displacement in the north side neighborhood that's within Providence Park. Um, they do have experience building in north side, um, which we thought was good. For land use, this applicant met uh, or exceeded um, as well. Um, they included site plans, you know, preliminary uh, conceptual site plans and a detailed budget for a similar home that was built recently. Um, there's a detailed development timeline uh, that was not in the documents, but was confirmed by email <clears throat> that included a proposed uh, 13 to 18 month timeline with time for SUPs, which would be necessary, and for uh, Chesapeake Bay Act uh, land disturbance permit would be necessary as well. So they really have a solid plan here. Um, for alignment with goals, we said meets and exceeds. Um, Again, this and the other application both propose CLT units, but this one proposed four instead of one, which does kind of uh, exceed the, uh, you know, the, our expectations for creating affordable housing. And as well, commitment to affordability. Um, for these units or for these parcels, we um, agreed to require community land trust participation for all owner occupied homes built on the parcels. Um, <clears throat> I did note that the sales prices proposed um, for this project were higher than the CLTs uh, usually are. Um, we have talked about um, what we would do about that uh, in the case that this development went forward, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, then Habitat for Humanities uh, <clears throat> proposal for this, um, again, they cited statistics and demographics their home buyers and statistics about the neighborhood showing there's a great need for affordable housing. Um, we, for plan for land use, um, technically we said does not meet because their um, plan was pretty bare bones because they work with uh, home owners or work with home buyers first and foremost to build their, uh, to design or, you know, to spec their homes. So they didn't submit any concrete plans because they just don't have them. However, um, they have built some homes with us in the past. However, um, some they have had some trouble building on Richard Land Bank lots in the past specifically. Um, for alignment with goals, we rated them meets. Um, they, uh, of course, meet our goal for affordable housing uh, and commitment to affordability. Of course, they agreed to the CLT requirement. So based on everything we just said, um, <clears throat> Staff is um, suggesting Bell 4316's application. Um, they do have a longer timeline than Habitat. Um, proposal, like I said, those prices are higher than we usually do for MWCLT, but we would be willing to find some extra funding in order to bring those prices down to typical levels for our program. <laughs> As well, they provide letters of support from leaders in the affordable housing industry. Um, which we thought was really great. So for 1903 and 1905 Sims Avenue, we're gonna go over Commonwealth Catholic Charities application first. Again, they included 20 low-income senior apartments, um, space for assistance programs in that building, as well as a ground floor retail space and for a neighborhood market style um, situation. Size of the apartments, one bedroom, one bathroom, 570 feet at 428 dollars to 995 dollars per month um we rated this uh application exceeds in all but one category um they have a very 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 thorough application um they cited all kinds of demographic market conditions as well as uh, they were very knowledgeable about the history of the spring hill neighborhood um and and we're able to demonstrate a, a really serious need for senior apartments and as well a neighborhood store in the neighborhood. Um, they have experience engaging with communities, um, engaging with you know civic associations and others um, for their senior apartment project, which is currently underway in Northside. 
Uh, and as well, they had a written letter of support from Councilmember Lynch, whose district includes uh, Spring Hill, which we love to see. Um, <clears throat> I should also note that they um, seem to have community engagement built into their timeline and built into their plan already. Um, so there will be more, like I said, more opportunities for engagement past the campaign. Their plan for land use is also very thorough. Um, they have partnered with a large architecture and construction firms to develop preliminary site plans, building concepts, um, which I love. Um, I, I'll just give my opinion there. I thought it was really cool. Um, the proposal would conform to zoning um, because it's a B3 business district. Multifamily housing is allowed by right. Um, which would bypass the need for a special use permit, uh, which the other two proposals would require. Um, for alignment with goals, we said this exceeds our expectation um, by providing both 20 deeply affordable rental units as, as well as um, a space for um, a you know neighborhood store, which, which we try to support commercial uses. And also they include plans for raised bed gardening space for tenants, um, aligning with our urban agriculture a little bit. As for permanent affordability, um, they plan to use low income housing tax credits, um, which um, do carry a 30 year commitment, uh, affordability commitment typically. Um, but many properties uh, that use uh, low income housing tax credits do remain affordable after their initial. So for project homes, they propose 12 permanently affordable CLT owner occupied units in a side by side. Uh, configuration. Um, each three bedroom, two bathroom, 700 square feet, sell, selling for $205,000. Um, they did demonstrate the need for affordable housing in Spring Hill in their application. Um, they did provide a detailed timeline, a sketch of the site plan, and sustainable building plans. Uh, they didn't include a budget. However, they have a good track record generally um, building this type of home. Um, their proposal, we said, meets slash exceeds our. Uh, our, our goal of uh, permanently affordable housing with greater density. Um, and as well, their commitment to affordability, of course, is that they will be CLT, which we did require. For Habitat for Humanity, um, they proposed two permanently affordable CLT units. Um, <clears throat> they um, did uh, demonstrate the need for affordable housing in Spring Hill in their application. Um, again, with the land use plan, there was no solid plan because um, they're still, you know, figuring they would they would need to figure out who their home buyers would be first. Um, for our goals, um, that that would meet our goal of affordable housing, give it a meet instead of a meet plus exceeds because it's lower density, um, and as well they are committed to affordability. Um, <clears throat> so our recommendation here is the Commonwealth South of Charities Housing Corporation proposal. Um, their timeline is much longer than either Project Homes or Habitat because, you know, because of the nature of, of LIHTC funding, permitting needed to build something of this size. Um, we're talking on a scale of several years uh, as opposed to the you know 12 to 18 to 24 months typically seen in land bank properties. Um, but um, we believe it to be worth it to, for the impact this project will have in providing housing for you know vulnerable low income senior population um, they have provided a robust uh, a robust plan and a lot of support from local leadership which we really appreciate um, oh i just realized I There we go. So for 5913 Ferguson Road, again, this uh, 3000 West Clay uh, submitted that application for a cottage with uh, for rent with space for a food garden. One bedroom, one bathroom. Again, his plans indicated 775 square feet um, for, the, for the cottage itself and affordable to families making 80% of AMI or below for 15 years. Um, this application we rated meets. Uh, they uh, did claim that there is need for affordable housing um, in West Hampton and urban agriculture, but um, didn't really, you know, put anything to back that up. But 
believable claim anywhere in the city, of course. Um, thorough plan for land use, um, we said meets. They provided a budget and timeline, an example of a similar project they completed, um, as well as a, a conceptual site plan, a quick sketch of how they would avoid the sewer easement. Um, however, there is a lot more due diligence required for this property. There are specific stormwater concerns that a lot of neighbors have raised um, that this property tends to flood. And so there's a lot more due diligence needed um, before we know if it is definitely, definitely doable or not. Um, for our alignment with goals, I rated this meet seeds. Um, it addresses both affordable housing and urban agriculture goals, which I thought was really cool. Um, and for the commitment to affordability, again, like I mentioned earlier, um, Mr. George has agreed to uh, be accountable to MWCLP for his uh, affordability of his apartment, or for his uh, cottage, rather. And then for St. Christopher's School, um, for positive impact on community, unfortunately, we, we didn't rate this very highly because the, the, the um, application basically states that um, it's going to be used for the school purposes only. Um, so not a public community garden, but rather a, uh, a school community garden. Um, they did not submit any plans for land use, um, but uh, considering the use that they're proposing, we don't think that's necessarily necessary. Or we don't think that's strictly necessary. Uh, and of course, they did meet the goal of urban agriculture. We gave them one for there. Um, our recommendations here are kind of complicated. Um, like I said earlier, uh, more due diligence is required to determine whether it is actually possible to build on this parcel. Um, so what we're suggesting is that um, we can is that the the cap can, uh, if it chooses to, recommend transfer to three thousand West Clay on a provisional basis. Um, once the due diligence is done, um, if we find out that it is not buildable at all, then we reserve the right to transfer it to St. Christopher's instead for their, for their application. Um, we think this is a good compromise. Um, again, whoever gets it, we will make sure that they um, conform to the um, stormwater, that they will, they will address the stormwater issues that folks have been seeing out there. As well as for 3602 and 3100, uh, 3602 Delaware Ave and 3100 Olive Avenue, we didn't receive any applications, so we're prepared to develop them internally. Um, let's see. Moment. Any questions so far, cap members? I don't, I don't see anybody raising their hand or indicating that they have a comment yet, so. All right. Uh, in that case, then, um, very quickly, um, I'm going to start our public comment period for these applications. Um, we hope to uh, last about 15 minutes with this, um, taking us to about 625, 6.30. Um, um, I am going to start by reading off the comments we received on our website, and then Sharon, I will hand it off to you for the rest of the meeting. So um, we received a number of comments from people in uh, the areas of 5913 Ferguson Road and Thames Avenue. Um, those are the only two properties that received comments. I'm going to try and read them off by um, area. So I'm going to start with the Ferguson Road and then move on to the South Avenue properties. Um, this first comment is from Raymond Clark, who I believe is in the meeting with us tonight. Um, he says, my property is located at Ferguson Road, directly impacted by development located at 913 Ferguson Road. I am in support of the Christopher School Foundation plan for the property. Um, Melissa Layfield, also a neighbor, says, please consider this lot for the community garden for Christopher School. This is a city neighborhood with houses that are all owned, and everyone works really hard to maintain their property. There are a few neighborhood. There are very few neighborhoods in the city that have small, well-maintained houses. The low-income rental property will hurt the neighborhood. Please consider the community garden. Deborah Michael, also in this area. <clears throat> My vote is for St. Christopher School to buy it. We need more green space in this area. 
uh, Catherine and William Bayless, also in this area. The only practical and logical use of this parcel would be the St. Christopher proposal for a community garden. Any other use would not be compatible with the neighborhood. Susan Farrell, uh, who I believe is also in this meeting, um, says about 5913 Ferguson, the lot is consistently flooding and it's swamp like. Uh, it's risky for building structures, better suited to a community garden, great neighborhood and or student project, multi-generational endeavor, environmentally responsible, perhaps Duran Chavis would agree to be involved. Um, there's no commitment from Duran Chavis. Uh, he has not uh, said anything about this. We haven't contacted him about it, just speculation. Uh, and those are all the comments we received about Ferguson Road. Now about uh, Sam's Avenue from Jason Hendrick, um, fully support Commonwealth Catholic Charities, would request green planting along the alley, evergreen trees or shrubs. Second vote is for habitat. Project homes are not at all fitting with the architectural style of the area. We don't do Italianate homes here at that in Churchill. Single family detached or attached should not be here. This is a commercial strip. Development should be commercial use. From Jonathan Miller, I have lived in the neighborhood West 28th Street for about 10 years. I think the Habitat Communities proposal makes the most sense for the space and the community. Heather Kachurka, I hope I'm saying that right. Heather, if you're here, very sorry if you're not. Um, I live in the Spring Hill neighborhood and I like the two unit proposable by Habitat Community. I think that is the best use for space. Andrew Duke, um, I live across the Sims Avenue from 1903-1905 Sims Avenue site and also frequent bus stop from the site. Uh, that is a good thing to note. There is a, a GRTC stop or something. I support the proposal for a mixed use development, including affordable senior housing, and believe this would be a welcome addition to the area. The area is well served by transit and is located near an existing affordable housing complex for seniors. Also, the neighborhood would benefit greatly from the neighborhood market space proposed for the bottom floor of the development. I do not believe the other two proposals for the site are ambitious enough in adding housing to the area. City leadership has recently declared a housing crisis and building a smaller number of homes on the site will not add enough affordable housing to the area. From Haley Minter, as a neighbor of the 1903-1905 Sims Ave site and frequent user of that bus stop, I am in support of the Commonwealth Catholic Charities proposal. The area is in need of additional housing options outside of single family homes and the opportunity for retail at street level provides the neighborhood an opportunity for a walkable small grocer. From uh, Asha McKelvey, I am a Spring Hill resident and homeowner just around the corner from 1903-1905 Seventh Avenue property. First, I ask that no decision be made about this property's bid proposal be made at this meeting. Um, the neighborhood residents were only made aware of this meeting and three proposals on the 14th via the business circle. With only four days, not all neighbors potentially impacted by the development at this location have been contacted. Of those contacted, not all have had adequate time to review and or fully understand each proposal. Second, I would like to request that the organizations that submitted proposals for the SEMS property hold a meeting or meetings with Spring Hill neighbors and stakeholders to review the proposals and answer questions. Thirdly, as a nearby neighbor slash homeowner, my preference of the three proposal bids is the Habitat for Humanity proposal. My past experience as a volunteer with Habitat showed me the value their project brings to a community neighborhood and the future homeowners. This proposal should also provide adequate outdoor and green space for families to thrive. The house designs are a good fit as gateway into the Spring Hill neighborhood. This proposal creates the least concern for traffic flow, parking, and pedestrian safety that current residents have about the proposed development. The Catholic Charities proposal has a lot of potential, but I have concerns about how all of the benefits of this proposal actually play out in reality. How will it be guaranteed that the building stays senior living only? Is the retail space guaranteed to be a small grocery with fresh foods and not a type of retail that could be damaging to the neighborhood, like a vape shop or a convenience store with mostly carrying alcohol or tobacco, beer, and wine? How will the, how will the parking and traffic flow on our already tight residential streets be affected by adding 20 apartments and retail? How will safety for pedestrians and vehicle traffic on Sims Avenue be addressed? This small area of Sims has had pedestrian fatalities in the past. Will the building have barriers or adequate setback protecting it from traffic hazards? Lastly, the project home proposal seems like way too much building density for the property and the least well thought out of the three proposals. There would be little outdoor and green space. This proposal really failed to address the Spring Hill neighborhood slash community in particular. It has similar pitfalls in terms of traffic flow, pedestrian safety, and parking as the Catholic Charities proposal. 
The examples of the townhouse designs are less reflective of the adjacent Spring Hill Historic District and existing architecture in the neighborhood of Spring Hill, especially when compared to the habitat community options and does not bring an innovative design like the capital charity proposal. Thank you for your consideration. And I again, strongly encourage the Spring Hill neighborhood be given more time to engage with the process of these proposal bids. <clears throat> Um, finally, from Janice Carter Lovejoy, I'm commenting about the proposed development at the 1900 block of 10th Avenue. I am concerned about vehicle ingress and egress into the housing. That portion of Sims is extremely busy with cars rapidly coming from the intersection of Cowardin and Sims. I fear rear-end collisions without something done to make a safe right turn lane onto West 20th Street and a left turn lane when heading east to get onto West 20th Street. The depth of the lots uh, is shallow. How close to the sidewalk will the building be sited? Front porches or some sort of uh, frontage usable outdoor space is needed to make new residents feel part of the neighborhood. If senior apartments are built, the commercial space on the first level will need to be something that is primarily accessed by walking, such as a coffee shop, ice cream shop, et cetera, but it needs to be something that is family friendly. Unfortunately, the amount of space allotted in the development plans do not is not enough for a small grocery that people in the region are looking for. We don't need a high priced convenience store. Finally, it would be a nice improvement if a West 20th Street corner sign identifying the neighborhood as the Spring Hill Old and Historic District would be welcomed by the existing and the new residents. That is all of the public comments we received on our website. Um, Sharon, would you like to take over with um, comments from folks in the meeting? Certainly, and, and Flora, thank you for all the hard work um that you have done and the maggie walker community land trust staff for putting together all of this information and overseeing this process i, I know it's a lot of work and so um on my behalf and on the um cap members we thank you very much for all of your work um and and now if we could get the cap members um together um, I just kind of want to get a sense from each of you. I believe we have enough for a quorum. Um, at least we did when we started to have your report out. Um, and I'm just trying to go through the people invite list. And I think we still have the five of us here. Um, is there any one process that you'd like to be able to do? Do you want to tackle these based on um, the order that we started with, which is 207 East Ladies Mile Road, and talk about the projects and the recommendations. And I don't think there was any public comments on that particular one, if I'm not mistaken, Flora. Um, there were a number of them. There were, or, uh, there were no comments for the, for the East Ladies Mile. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's right. Uh, we do still have some time for folks to chime in, though, if they if they would like. Okay, is there anyone then um, here participating that would like to provide comments to this group uh, so that we can listen and take that under consideration? Yes. Okay, Mr. Carter Lovejoy. Yes. Um, <clears throat> it, it sounds like. Um, I, I mean, I think that. Our our neighborhood, and I live in the in Spring Hill district. And my wife uh, did provide some comments. Um, I think we like we like the idea of the Catholic Charities proposal, but uh, it, it sounds like if that's the consensus going to roll that way, we would still like to have some input into what's going on. The neighborhood's very concerned with, you know, we have a small neighborhood that's under a lot of pressure, and we would like to. Um, to see this development be a, a real positive for our neighborhood, and so we would like like to be assured that if we're, if um, Catholic Charities is going to pursue this, that we would have an opportunity to review more detailed plans and continue to be engaged with with the process. Uh, is that something that's possible that we can count on? Well, if I understand correctly, Flora, they would need to go through a public um, special use permit application. Is that correct? Uh, no. So Commonwealth Catholic oh. Charities proposal conforms to the existing zoning. Oh, it does. However, okay. however they do build in uh, into their application. They did state that they intend to do some deep community engagement with the Spring Hill community as part of their process. Okay. Um, their designs and concepts are not final. Um, they will be working with the community if they are awarded this property. Thank you for that additional information. So no public review process that's required by zoning or land use 
but that Commonwealth Catholic Charities has indicated if they are selected that they would have a robust uh, community engagement with the Spring Hill um, residents and stakeholders. Hey, Flora, I just have a quick question. Is that parcel within the Alden Historic uh, District? Because I know Spring Hill is, but I don't know whether it includes that parcel. It's a great question, actually. Um, I'll research that um, while we're doing public comments and get back to you during the discussion. Right, be because if it is, um, that whole process includes um, a lot of public. A lot of public. <laughs> Uh, we have someone telling us it's not in the old and historic district. Um, and so I'm guessing that you know that well, but we'll just check it on the on the zoning maps just to be sure. Uh, thank you, Flora, for just double checking. Is there anybody else um, attending tonight that want to offer comment for the CAP to consider? Um, uh, yes, sir. If the comments were appropriate regarding the 207 East Ladies Mall, uh, I would just like to say uh, uh, I represent the Bell 4316 proposal, and we would welcome uh, the participation of Maggie Walker Land Trust in ways to reduce the cost or any other uh, suggestions they have to reduce the cost. That would be great. Ah, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Schwal. Did I pronounce your last name correctly? Uh, no. Close, but not quite. Shul. Oh. Shul. Sorry, Mr. Shul. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And did I see someone else come up that wanted to offer comment to our group? Yeah. Mr. Clark? Yeah, I think as far as the um, uh, property at 913, uh, obviously we've covered the, uh, the flooding and the ponding. Uh, the other thing I'd like to address is the parking. Uh, everybody along Ferguson uh, pulls in off the street. And um, so in order to get off that off that piece of property, you'd have to back into traffic. And looking at the site plan and where the house is located, it's almost right in the curve. So if you're coming from um, Andre, you know, from St. Christopher's, your base, the, the, the people aren't going to see the, the people coming out of the house backing up. So uh, I checked the um, I checked into it. So the Federal Highway Administration has recommendations on looking left and right. Uh, at 20 miles an hour, you need 225 feet to look left, and look right is 195 feet. I don't think it's going to meet even come close to that. So and and then you've got a lot of new drivers at St. Christopher's. I'm sure there's a lot of folks that are just getting their driver's license and they might be going over 20 miles an hour. So just, uh, I think that, that that's, there's a, potent, a safety hazard there. Okay, thank you for your input. We appreciate it. Is there anyone else that would like to speak on any of these particular sites tonight? Uh, yes, I'm Stuart Carter and I'd like to speak on the uh, 5913 Ferguson. Thank you for the opportunity to do so. Um, I have been involved with the Westview Civic Association over the last 20 years, maybe 10 of those years as president. And uh, neighbors expressed a very strong interest in that parcel at 5913 over the years to preserve it as green space. And our board checked into that some many years ago, probably at least 10 years ago. And we were told by the city that the lot was not buildable and therefore there were no steps necessary for the Westview community to have to take to preserve that lot as green space. Uh, so that information sounds as if maybe it's changed or partially changed, the lot is partially buildable, um, but we worked under a different set of assumptions. Um, we've actually shown a very, very strong commitment to green space here with community fundraising to plant trees around here, uh, taking care of it and doing that. So um, it feels a bit misleading that then this property changed hands. It's still actually listed in the city database as owned by Public Works. 
its future land use is still listed as OS, which is open space, which is what we had always been told. Um, and so there's some concern among the neighbors with, um, you know, what we would have done had we been told that that this lot, something different was going, going to happen with it. And we would have taken steps to try to preserve the green space. There's very little of that left around here. Uh, so that's important to neighbors. And they, we've shown with our, with our wallets, with our work and uh, desire to maintain some green space here in the city. Um, the, the other thing is uh, the water has been mentioned. Um, all of us neighbors have had to put in extensive French drain uh, water removal systems. And every time a new impervious surface gets built somewhere around here, we all end up paying a consequence for that with water heading uh, towards our yards. This is, an, um, if you look at a map, the topographical map, it's an incredibly low lying area. And actually water comes down from Grove Avenue to this, this whole area. And it sits for, for quite a while um, in yards, streets, the gutters, uh, this, this particular lot. 5913 as well. Um, we've had a lot of activity here in terms of building with a new parking lot in the last 15, 10 years that happened. Um, buildings from the school and, and infill development. And they actually moved Ferguson Road about three years ago to allow some additional building. So the, the water issue for us is sort of front and center. And I, I hear this engineering report and I, I understand that it may look okay. I also know a recent house that was built near here. They had to bring in truckloads of gravel to put in the foundation to build on top of because the Tiber Creek uh, ran under this street and that lot. And, and it was built over some maybe 40 years ago. So I hope that these considerations will you know, be front and center in the review and the minds of the advisors um, for this. And for us, um, whether it's a community garden or leaving it as the open green space that it is, that would be uh, my desire, but also the desire of so many people here and where we thought uh, we were with that lot until um, actually we all just read this um, March 30 article and that's the first we heard that in fact this lot had been uh, designation changed as buildable. Um, but thank you for the opportunity to be able to give a little background. And thank you so much for your concerns for us to consider. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else attending tonight? that would like to address the citizen advisory panel with any concerns you may have? I, I guess I'd like to speak up just once more um, with regard to the issue that um, that my wife raised in her comments, the, tra the concern about the traffic. Sems is a very busy road. Um, I presume that, that access would be to the, to the facility would be from an alley of, you know, on the backside away from Sems. Um, but then again, still concerned with how that um, that property would interact with a uh, 20th and 19th streets, and with uh, some some assurance that um, traffic can come safely in off of a Sems onto onto 20th Street. I think that's a that's a concern that's going to have to be really looked closely at. Okay. Well, thank you again, uh, Mr. Carter Lovejoy, for your concern over the traffic impact. Um, that it may have entering um, SEMS, that that is in fact um, something that might happen because of this proposal. So thank you for addressing the citizen advisory panel. Um, may I speak? Can I be heard? Yes, Ms. Farrell. Um, thank you. And thank you for this opportunity. My house backs up to the Ferguson green space now. And I would be more than willing to share some photographs with you of pictures I took just this last um, fall that constantly my yard is flooding and that lot is flooding. And 
I have spent lots of time and had engineers to try to help abate the water situation. And it still is flooding and swamp-like. And so I, I'm just concerned uh, uh, whomever tries to build on this lot, how that's going to work. As Stuart Carter said, we're in low line, we're on the Tiber, and the water is an issue. My house is, as I say, adjacent. Stuart Carter's is um, a couple from that. And the developer, I don't know if this was brought out, from Northern Virginia. Um, did I lose you? Nope, we're, oh. we're right here. Oh, okay, I lost the picture. Um, from Northern Virginia, purchased the house on the other side of the lot and raised it and ran into such a water problem that he's now put the lot up for sale because he finds it untenable in terms of a building lot. So, and this lot that um, we're looking at is even lower than that lot, is certainly. Um, as I say, I have photographs that I'd be happy to, to share with you um, that might give you some idea of what happens there on that lot. Um, somebody just mentioned to me, um, I had written a comment about a community garden and maybe Duran Chavez would work with us, but somebody suggested I never thought about this, of, of planting fruit trees there. And, you know, that that might be a, a way to be able to use the lot and make use of the water situation. And um, you wouldn't have maybe even the challenges trying to make a community garden. But well, thank you for, for, for letting us speak to you and giving us a chance to talk about what we see in the neighborhood. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Farrell, for sharing with us some of what you know firsthand is happening there uh, with the stormwater issues. So thank you very much for contributing. Sharon, if I could speak, this is David Reynolds. Yes, Mr. Reynolds. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for putting this uh, together. We appreciate being a part of it. I am the uh, treasurer of the St. Christopher School Foundation. We submitted the bid for the Ferguson property to operate it as a community garden. I also serve as the CFO of, of St. Christopher School in a dual role. I just wanted to clarify one comment. Um, I've been chatting uh, with Flora in the, in the chat. Um, and in our, in our proposal, or, or Flora's comments noted that our proposal was to use the garden for school purposes only. Um, that maybe was a little unclear in our proposal. It is our intent to operate it really as a community garden is normally operated, which I, I believe means that the plats are made available to the community members. Certainly those community members would be the school partially, but we our intent would be to operate it such that those plats are very much available to the neighbors and the surrounding community, which is kind of the way we were to our, our proposal. Thank you very much for that clarification. We appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Ms. Nicholas? Simone, are you trying to address us? No, I was not. Oh, okay. Your name is showing up on my screen, so I wasn't sure. No. So I do, because since you asked, I do have a question about the 1902 Sims lot. They mentioned that there was going to be a retail space, but that's all, all they said in terms of the, apart, the senior housing and the retail space. What type of retail space are they looking to put there? Um, we can address this in the in the discussion portion, but um, in the in the application that they made, they did specifically mention a neighborhood grocery store. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you for your question. Is there anybody else attending today's uh, citizen advisory panel uh, meeting that would like to make comment? Yeah, my name is Jeremy Wyland, and I live in Spring Hill. My only comment would be to give the neighborhood more time for us to give y'all our view on things. We just feel a little bit rushed. We've done the, my wife has moved heaven and earth to try to get neighbors together, but it's just a very short time period. And I think everybody would be more happy if we could just have more time to come to a consensus that we could share with you. That's all the comment I have. Thank you. We appreciate you addressing us and giving us that input. 
Anybody else that's listening in that wants to provide us comment? Alrighty, I think we're all right then to move on to the discussion period. Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead, Sharon. No, I was just going to ask um, the advisory panel members um, how they would like to approach this. Um, again, I think we have 207 East Ladies Mile Road. And if I'm correct, I didn't hear you read any comments received. And I don't hear, I don't remember anybody providing any uh, comments today, this, this evening to us. Um, and so I'm just going to ask the panel members if they want to discuss that one first. I think that sounds like a great idea, Sharon. Okay. And if I can recall from what you had up on the screen, Flora, there were two applicant proposals. One was for Habitat for Humanity for one unit, and the other applicant was from Bell 4316 LLC for four uh, affordable units. Both were affordable to households at or around 80% of area median income. And if I can remember the staff recommendation um, was to um, move to, with an award to Bell 4316 LLC. So I'll just open the floor to anybody here um, in, uh, in the advisory panel if anybody wants to make a comment for discussion. Wow, we're quiet tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, um, I, I, I think just in general, um, having the four units is better than just one unit. Um, and I think this proposal, there wasn't, there was maybe some need for some additional funding in order to make them affordable. I don't know whether I'm confusing that with one of the other proposals or not. Uh, yeah. I think yeah. Um, I so. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Flora. Go ahead. Um, so um, $230,000 was the proposed sales price, um, which is um, still, you know, significantly below market um, what what the median sales price is in Richmond right now. Right. Um, but we, uh, for Maggie Walker Community Land Trust Homes, we try to shoot a little bit lower, mm -hmm. um, closer to, um, you know, 180, you know, 190-ish. Um, but um, I've spoken with um, our team and we think we can, um, you know, scrape some funding together to um, get these homes down to a level that's closer, uh, more in line with our, our usual program. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Does uh, James or Phil or Sheba have any comments or issues? Are you leaning one way or another? Um, thank you, Lynn, for recommending that you prefer four units over one. Yep. Um, I don't. I don't have input. I think, given the state of where we are, I obviously think four units is better than one as well. Um, but not a lot of input. Okay, James. Oh, I see you also have text in commented that you also prefer more units. Phil, is that where you're leaning, or do you feel differently? No, I, I agree. Four is, is better than one, uh, especially in our uh, supply crunch. Um, and for Mr. Shul, this is just an idea, um, but depending on the level of uh, energy efficiency, um, potential um, renewable energy uh, systems, uh, especially with the new Inflation Reduction Act, there are um, multiple funding sources available to uh, cover um, most of, if not over, uh, those costs. And that may be something to uh, look into in terms of covering costs. But I know uh, construction costs are high regardless right now. So, and I appreciate your proposal. I'm, okay. I'm working along those lines and we'll seek to do that. Great, good to know. Um, we always want energy efficiency for long-term operation. And while you were speaking, Phil, I know uh, Chanel 
um, commented that she also was from more units. Um, so it sounds to me, and I, I have to agree with the, the rest of the advisory panel members, um, we have a, a housing, affordable housing crisis here in the city and in, in the greater Richmond area besides across most of the country. Um, so I would probably be in the same boat that you all in uh, supporting a recommendation. So is it fair to say that for 207 East Ladies Mile Road that there's consensus that the advisory panel is recommending um, um, to agree with the staff recommendation of Bell uh, 4316 LLC? This is hard because I'm used to teams where at least I get thumbs up or I can see all the right people at the same time <laughs> on my screen. But I think that's true. And Flora, correct me if I was wrong in my conclusion. Uh, uh, no, that, that all looks good. I'm seeing thumbs up from James, from Sheba. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Now on to the hard ones. <laughs> So let's tackle 1903-1905 Sims Avenue next. Um, heard a lot of comments. Again, there's um, three proposals, one from Project Homes for 12 attached units uh, with a sales price of uh, 205,000 um, and affordability to homeowners um, at and around 80% of AMI. There's also a proposal from Habitat for Humanity uh, that a number of the Spring Hill um, um, residents supported for two units, again, for sale. Sales prices between 165 and 240, depending upon whether it's a three or four bedroom home, same affordability level at 80% of AMI. And then the third proposal, which is the proposal that um, staff is recommending to the advisory panel for consideration, which is Commonwealth Catholic Charities. They are proposing 20 senior rental apartments, and I believe that's age 55 and older. Um, size would be one bedroom, one bathroom. Smallest would be 570 square feet up to 710 square feet. Rents would range from $428 uh, to $995 per month and affordability level any ranging from 30% up to 60% of AMI. And then we heard a number of comments, both written um, and uh, tonight on a number of several issues. And I think the one thing that I just wanna put out there for the advisory panel members to consider was there were, I at least heard several comments that um, the Spring Hill community would like more time um, to, to, to study all three proposals and be able to come back to um, this panel with some kind of a consensus recommendation because they had a very, very short period of time. Uh, I believe someone mentioned only four days to really get to study what was being proposed. So I just want to share that with the advisory panel and then open it up for discussion. Um, I just wanted to really quick mention um, these proposals were made public um, two weeks prior to this meeting. Um, they were sent out to city council members, um, representatives from civic associations, including Spring Hill. Um, if those weren't seen, um, uh, that is, um, you know, uh, I apologize for that. Um, that was, uh, that's my, my oversight to, 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 you know, fail to make sure that they were seen, but they were made public, they were made available. Um, and as well, these, these properties have been um, public knowledge and, you know, uh, to uh, Spring Hill Civic Association and others um, for almost two years now. Um, so I, I want to, you know, just say that I, I did not uh, intend to give only uh, four days of public comment uh, period. There, there was, there was um, a lot of time leading up to this. Um, that's all. Um, and I think Charles um, Hall had something to say about the uh, community engagement portion. Charles Hall from Commonwealth Catholic Charities. Charles. 
Uh, so good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Charles with uh, Commonwealth Catholic Charities and the Vice President of Housing. Um, I can't necessarily answer a lot of your questions because, I mean, we're, we're fairly early in the design process, let's say, but I think that we can commit to doing extensive community engagement with the Spring Hill community as well as kind of surrounding neighborhoods. Um, we have a similar project in the north side of Richmond in the Green Park neighborhood. Um, and we kind of met with them for as long as it took to kind of come to consensus. So I think that's something that we can commit to is a robust kind of engagement process with y'all. Thank you for, for offering that up and, and coming here and being able to, to represent Commonwealth Catholic Charities and making that commitment. We appreciate that. Thank you. Advisory panel members, um, anybody want to uh, open the discussion? Anybody have any strong feelings one way or the other? Um, I do, as always. Um, I'm really familiar with, with that site. My first preference is to have the senior housing because I think that's it's an incredible need um, in, in this neighborhood. There's been a lot of rental development um, that is all market rate. And so it's very hard for uh, folks that have been in our neighborhood for a long time and, um, you know, can't, you know, may maybe they want to sell their house, but, you know, finding um, a quality rental property is really di difficult for seniors. Um, and then the, just the fact that its location is close to everything is, is a major plus. I do have concerns though about traffic um, and how you, how they might get in and get out of that site. It is pretty narrow. Um, so, you know, if, if the consensus is to go with, um, Commonwealth Catholic Charities proposal, um, they'll have, I would imagine they're going to have to go through a pretty rigorous, uh, development review with the city, um, because they'll have to get, I guess, um, a POD in order to build there. Um, but I think that, um, the traffic is is definitely an issue um, at that intersection. And then the impact, you know, seeing your housing typically doesn't produce a whole lot of um, parking requirements or lots of cars moving in and out of those developments. But Spring Hill is a tiny little community. Um, and so, again, traffic flow is really important. So just kind of words of caution and giving everybody a lot of time to work through those issues, I think would be really important. Thank you, Lynn. And I, I think you're right. Um, it is difficult to get in and out on SEMS. And we know that it's sometimes a speeder um, mm -hmm. traffic, traffic road as well here in the city. Um, anybody else uh, from the panel would like to offer up comments and uh, or anything of their concern? Yeah, I think I think I share a lot of what Lynn said. Um, I do appreciate that the uh, Commonwealth Charities proposal is by right, so they don't have to go through a uh, special use permit process, which could, um, you know, delay things even further. Um, any development um, in the proposal, it did indicate um, that there were like ten or eleven off-street parking. Um, spaces proposed. Uh, again, I realize it's pretty early in the design phase, but uh, didn't see where that was indicated on the plan submitted. Um, I don't know if Charles, you're able to speak to that. Um, and I think something that myself and uh, neighborhood residents would be interested in is uh, kind of what the status is of any potential commercial tenant. Like, do you kind of have you know, without without giving away too much, uh, without paperwork signed, do you have have you been in conversation uh, with a particular um, end user, or are these still pretty uh, early on kind of thoughts and and hopes? Um, so we are we are very early, uh, and just for a reference, we used something like the Shields Market and the Fan, which neighborhood growth here, it's 1100 square feet. So we're, we're showing 1600 square feet. So it's a little bit larger. Um, Shields Market is not a kind of a beer or wine convenience store. They serve a lot of kind of 
produce and fresh fruits. Um, so we're hoping for something kind of similar there. Um, but no, we haven't been in discussion with anybody in particular. Um, and any other question about parking? I think we have 16 kind of off street parking spaces that are shown. Um, some of those would be reserved for tenants and some would be kind of reserved for the market. Um, and then the updated scenes, tenants that are not from that as many parking kind of as like younger folks. And so we're not anticipating all 20 units having cars. Um, so. Thank you for that, uh, that input, um, Charles. We appreciate it. Anyone else on the panel want to provide their thoughts? Sheba? No, I don't. I don't have anything to add. I am. Do you have, um, do you have a preference or not? I am abstaining. I am actually on the uh, CCC Housing Development Board, so. Abstention. <laughs> okay, well, that there's a conflict, and I'm glad you said that. So uh, you are abstaining. Okay, um, James, do you have a preference? Well, hope we didn't lose him. I know he said he was driving. Chanel says she has no particular preference. Okay. James, are you still with us? I see you James, here listed. James is in the in the chat also saying he has no problem. Ah, okay. That's interesting because I don't have anybody used to have all the things showing up on the chat. Now we don't. Oh, there you go. All right. Sorry. No preference. No preference. So no preference. Um, so we have Lynn leaning towards the Catholic Charity Senior Housing. Phil, it sounds like you're leaning towards the senior housing. Um, I personally would also be leaning towards the senior housing. I think um, we have a growing uh, aging in population um, and um, there's a, a, a huge need for, for senior housing. And so um, I would be in support of that as well. I know the goal here is tonight to try to reach consensus. Um, Sheba is abstaining. So... Um, I'm going to ask um, both Chanel and James, who don't seem to have a preference, if they'd be willing to reach um, consensus with the other three of us, or um, is this a, okay? So James so got two thumbs up. So back to Chanel, who has no preference. Senior housing. Okay, so I think uh, I think Flora out of the the ones of us. Which, um, with Sheba abstaining, we, we have reached consensus on supporting the Co uh, Commonwealth Catholic Charity proposal. All right, great. Thank you. Okay. 5913 Ferguson Road. Um, heard a lot of issues and concerns raised with stormwater, um, which I think is a, is a huge concern. Um, um, with 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 whichever way we go with this one, and if I can go back, there's um, St. Christopher's School Foundation, which was willing to purchase the site um, as a community garden, and it would be a true public community garden. And then 3000 West Clay LLC, which is John K. George and Company, who is proposing um, one one bedroom, one bath cottage that would be rented for 15 years and affordable to a household earning at or around 80% of AMI. Um, and we had a lot of comments um, from the community on this particular site. And again, I, I want to emphasize the one that I heard the most, which is there, appear, there appears to be some significant due diligence that needs to happen with regards to stormwater and whether the site is truly buildable or not. But I'll open it up for um, conversation uh, among the advisory panel members. One question I have um, is I noted that the school proposal for the garden um, listed a purchase price. 
Um, and I was wondering if uh, Mr. George, the the rental proposal also had uh, a purchase price with their application. So no, um, uh, Mr. George did not uh, state a purchase price um, for his, his application. Um, I wanted to clarify um, for everyone involved, both um, uh, for 3000 North Clay and for um, in Christopher's school that the purchase prices for these lots will be determined um, by MWCLT staff. Um, as according to our sort of policies as it relates to um, disposing of land bank properties. Um, for um, when we when we sell land bank properties, we do tend to, you know, sell them at a at a at a a lower rate. Um, but that's not set in stone. Um, it it is negotiable. We will there will be a negotiation no matter um, who uh, we elect to to sell the property to. Thank you, Flora, for that clarification. And I just want to put out there from uh, from a gardening standpoint, I am I am now concerned for both um, options at the table right now for us, because if the area is very, very wet, um, my experience in gardening is that can kill a plant just as easily as no water. <laughs> Lynn, you have any thoughts? <laughs> Yeah, the, the the one thing that I um, was wondering if the decision was to go to to um, transfer to sell the land to St. Christopher's, would they um, enter into a maintenance agreement with the CLT for long term maintenance of community gardens? Because um, you know, I've seen some of them around the city that after a couple years, they begin to look pretty ratty. You know, you uh, initially everybody's all enthusiastic about it and they're well maintained. And then after, you know, things change and then they, you know, end up not really being very attractive. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know whether we had a mechanism to hold the property owner, whoever would end up getting it to some type of um, an agreement around maintenance. And so that's one thing. So, but I, I agree with you, Sharon. I think that maybe we just need to do a little bit of more due diligence on that, on, on that piece of property, because, you know, I don't know, maybe it just stays with the city and it's just open space. Or yeah. Maybe Gotcha. I'm, I'm sorry, Flora. I'm I'm kind of leaning in the same direction, and that's why I I wanted to point out that if if there is a severe stormwater issue in that area, and um, that we should really check out exactly what is happening there, because I would hate to even have St. Christopher's invest in in creating it into a community garden, only to find out that the garden is flooding all the time as well. Um, well I, I think uh, just to speak somewhat somewhat counter to to that idea, um, if if we if the CLT awards the lot to St. Christopher's, I think there are some opportunities. One, uh, you know, they offered a purchase price, whether that is the price that it ends up being per staff um, or not is a, is another question. But I think there's a potential for that price to help subsidize the ladies mile um properties that that we've consented on uh to giving to uh Mr. Schul's project um so that's one thought secondly um i think if if it were to be awarded to the school as a garden i think that doesn't necessarily need to be a like food garden or or you know, vegetable garden, but it could also be. Um, of course, this would be uh, have to be put together between staff. Some kind of maintenance agreement. I agree, Len, uh, would need be needed. Um, but you know, like um, uh, like wetland re restoration or or something like that. Native native shrubs and and flowers and things to help uh, mitigate that. Uh, rainwater flooding whatever whatever the situation actually is um you know whether that's work 
some kind of combination of working with neighbors and students and uh, professionals uh, in the Richmond area that are familiar with that kind of native landscaping uh, work. That's my um, thought. So two great suggestions from Phil. One is uh, the purchase price could be used um, to offset the affordability um, and perhaps down payment assistance on uh, on um, 207 East Ladies Mill Ro Mile Road, and to create perhaps a rain garden um, as a way to manage the stormwater. Um, mm -hmm. So that, as you said, not necessarily a traditional community garden with you know fruits, vegetables, flowers, but perhaps um, something that you know is a garden per se, but is more of a stormwater management um, facility. Um, that looks like a garden. So two good ideas from Phil. Um, anybody else here? I'm looking. Um, pollinator garden, I see here is a, a, a comment. Um, I just wanted to mention really quickly, um, speaking to Lynn's um, question about the whole, um, you know, management uh, or maintenance agreement. Um, we do Obviously, we do development agreements um, for most land bank properties. This would be our first, um, if it were to go to, to St. Christopher, this would be our first community garden property. Um, and, you know, we would have to take a minute to work up a development agreement for that. But we think it would, I think it would probably take a pretty similar form to what we've used for other projects prior, uh, meaning the development agreement, you know, state specific um, set of criteria for the use and then says, you know, if you, if the recipient fails to, you know, comply with these terms, then we take the land back um, after a certain period of time. Um, so we do, we would, we would have our, our usual development agreement to enforce, uh, to enforce that. Um, Thank you. I don't want to, you know, throw another big um, wrench into this conversation, but I'm just wondering whether, St. Christopher's would be willing to engage with a landscape architectural firm to really do a, a thorough assessment about what the best use in terms of a garden or orchard or, you know, stormwater, outdoor pool, you know, and I, anyway, some somebody that's really um, skilled in looking at what the existing site is and and how best to um to manage it um without having to you know spend a gazillion dollars um because i would you know i i couldn't tell anybody whether you know a community garden is better than um a pollinator garden i you know i don't have any idea how you make those assessments but i was just wondering whether they might be willing to go through that process of engaging with a um with a professional that has that level of expertise i know that's an added cost but just kind of curious and i don't know sarah, if the gent go ahead yeah, sharon i'm not sure do you want applicant comments at this point i was quiet because i wasn't sure if you if you can speak to that issue, I know that's sort of putting you on the spot. Sure. So I kind of didn't want to put you on the spot. No, I don't mind. I know I don't mind being on the spot on the spot. I just wasn't sure whether you wanted comments from the applicants or not. What I would say is that first of all, I can't speak to the mechanics of how a maintenance agreement would work, but the way St. Christopher's has been thinking about this property as a community garden, that is consistent with our expectations that there would be some sort of ongoing expense and upkeep that the school would be taking on as a result of entering into this purchase. That's point number one. Um, point number two regarding the, you know, professional landscape architect, we certainly have used and engaged firms for our campus properties, and I could easily see us if that was a logical step to move this process forward, and the, and the, the committee or advisory council was interested in that, I could see us taking that step and providing some feedback uh, from St. Christopher's Foundation, but uh, in, inclusive of you know some professional uh, recommendations of what could be done, should be done on that property. Thank you for that uh, input. That's appreciated. Appreciated. Thank you so much. Oh, I, and I'm sorry. One extra thought on that. 
Um, Mr. Reynolds, would you be willing to take your plans then to the that neighborhood association, especially some of those um, adjoining property owners, just to let them know kind of what this professional might recommend? Absolutely, and I, I would I would hope that most of the individuals on this call would would say that that's kind of the normal method of operation from the school to to work through what the plans are that we're 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 working on for our own campus and share those with the neighbors. This one's a little different because it's a property we're we're seeking to acquire. But yeah, I think we would certainly open it up to the neighborhood. Great, thank you for, for a comment. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right. So again, I think. You know, the the um, recommendation was to actually go um, to um, 3000 West Clay, uh, but it sounds to me like um, from at least a couple of the advisory panel members where we are considering the big stormwater issues and, and the potential that some kind of a garden might be a better fit. But I'd like to hear from maybe James or um, Chanel or Sheba to kind of get some additional thought. Um, I I appreciate St. Christopher is reaching out to the community. I, I know how hard like the flooding and stormwater can be to a community. And I just, you know, I am very happy that they're willing to work with the neighbors and get this done. Um, that's all I guess. I'm okay. easy y'all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is John George. Is it possible for me to speak? Certainly, Mr. George. Um, is it appropriate that um, as the other applicant that I um, have a chance to address some of these concerns. Are you from the neighborhood, sir? No, I'm the actual applicant, John George. Oh, absolutely. I'm sorry. Didn't make the connection. My bad. <laughs> Certainly, Mr. George. Well, um, first of all, I think that um, I wanted to address a point of policy um, when I read the application for these homes, it clearly stated that anyone who wished to apply for a community garden would be renting the property, and people who were proposing housing um, could purchase the property. Does the land bank actually have a mechanism where they can sell property to someone for a community garden? Uh, so, yes. Um... The, I believe our policy uh, prior to this had been that if if someone, if a if a small uh, kind of community, you know, a very small organization wanted to start a community garden, then we would lease the land to them in order to do that. Or even if an individual wanted to do wanted to have a garden, that we would lease the land to them. Um, we weren't anticipating a large uh, uh, organization like St. Chris um, to come forward with this type of application. Um, and again, we haven't worked out the specifics of what the purchase price would be or what the development agreement would be or any of the actual mechanics of the sale, but the Richmond Land Bank is um, is authorized to sell properties um, for any of the uses that we um, are, uh, you know, that we are prioritizing, which includes community gardens. Okay, good. I wanted to just make that, just bring that up because the the way the current rules are written and printed on the website, they don't allow a sale for a garden. It clearly says it's rental. Um, the second point I wanted to make is that the uh, stormwater issues that are being raised about this property on Ferguson Road are all being raised by um, non-professionals in the uh, development and water management arena and i do understand adjacent homeowners whose property backs up to an essentially unmanaged uh city utility easement um i definitely can commiserate because um this property has a broad triangular um footprint 
and it's got a big footprint along Ferguson Road, which is the drainage way for properties going north, going up uh, Henry and up towards, um, you know, Libby Market and Grove Avenue. So if you have a property downstream of, you know, downhill of your property that isn't properly managed, that doesn't have drainage ways, is not properly contoured, that property can definitely cause problems up to the uphill neighbors. And I think that is what's happening here because I have noticed the topography of that lot has never been carefully contoured. It, it was just a way, it was just a place for the city to put uh, both a major stormwater line, which essentially is the Tiber Creek underneath the center of the lot and um, a good place to bring together two different large sanitary sewer lines. And although it's a grassy lot, it is definitely not contoured properly, but it does have significant rise from the curb line at Ferguson Road going north up towards Grove Avenue. And if it did not have that significant rise, then it would be a low lying area, would be subject to flooding. But I believe looking at the contours and especially the contours as delineated by the manhole top elevations of all three manholes on the lot, I am sure that that lot can be properly contoured to not only not flood itself, but to alleviate flooding on all of the properties that back up to both of its side property lines. So I think we have here an opportunity to actually correct neighborhood drainage problems instead of throwing our hands up in the air and saying, oh, it's a wet, swampy, triangular lot. I don't believe that it is at all. I would not be proposing to build on something that I thought could not properly drain. Thank you, Mr. George. So if I heard you correctly, you believe that part of the solution to building a one bedroom, one bath rental cottage would also be to address um, how the contouring of the site would be um, able to not only, if I heard you correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, manage on-site stormwater, but perhaps correct the, the flow of the stormwater off onto the adjacent property owners, um, which have a, a ponding issue when it rains. Did I hear you correctly? Yes, to the extent that they are elevated above Ferguson Road, which I believe they are looking at the city contour map. Mm -hmm. the, the Ferguson Road Triangle is serving as somewhat of a dam and holding water in those people's backyards, and that should be corrected. And any owner of that property would want that corrected. And if I were selected, I would make sure that the triangular parcel would not it would serve to convey stormwater off the nation off of the adjacent properties rather than hold it hold the stormwater against them, which I believe is what's happening now and has been happening for many years when the city owned it. Okay, well, thank you for providing that uh, information to us. Um, I find that very helpful. Yes, so go the stormwater concerns, the stormwater concerns were raised by the community when I developed the Tiber condominiums a few years ago, and there was a lot of concern that it would cause flooding, but actually the stormwater engineering that we installed and the curb and gutter actually alleviated the flooding along Guthrie Avenue, which is only a block and a half from this parcel. And the engineering company that I hired did such a fabulous job. I have never seen that intersection flood since. So water management is easy if you're an engineer and that's what you do for a living. You get it to go downhill where it's supposed to go. And that is what I'm proposing to do here on Ferguson Road. Gotcha. And so you're referring to the property at the Tiber Penthouse that's at the corner of Libby Avenue in Guthrie? Yeah, I developed that property a few years ago and and when and that intersection did flood a lot, but it has never flooded since we have finished the project. Okay. We helped a great deal with the drainage at that particular um, property. Well, thank you again, Mr. George. And, and back to the advisory panels, if stormwater um, can be successfully dealt with, um, is there any 
um, conversation among the advisory panels to consider the recommendation of the Maggie Walker Community uh, Lands uh, um, Trust that uh, that we should consider um, the award um, to Mr. to George uh, for the 3000 West Clay to create a one cottage, um, one bedroom, one bath rental. And I believe, um, Flora, you told us that he would be willing to make a commitment to a 15 year affordability period. Is that correct? Uh, this is Erica Sims with the Richmond Land Bank. Uh, Flora had to step away. Oh, uh, hi, Erica. Um, but she let me know that. And yes, that is correct. A 15 year affordability commitment. Okay. And Erica, is some of the things that Mr. George was just uh, discussing in terms of, you know, landscaping, water engineering, was that part of y'all's um, analysis and, and your recommendation? We did not do that extensive of a rec uh, analysis of the stormwater conditions. I think what would be required to do that would be to hire an engineer um, in order to evaluate the flooding that's happening um, and to, you know, visit the site at certain times that where flooding occurs and then to make a proposal for how to manage that flooding um, and manage that flooding with a development, uh, uh, additional development, additional stormwater runoff created by a development on the site. Erica, is it is it um, something that the um, land trust would consider if they if the um, a citizen advisory panel um, reaches consensus and I'm not sure we're going to tonight um, um, to award it to um, Mr. George that he would do his own due diligence to bring back to Maggie Walker in some period of shorter period of time. So it's not a financial burden to the land trust um, to be able to show that the, the stormwater issue could be engineered? Yes, I think we could do it one of two ways. Um, one would be through the mechanism of the development agreement, which would be at the time of transferring the property in that development agreement, we would stip we stipulate all of the requirements. Um, for the development, and so we could be explicit about a requirement that relates to stormwater management. Um, we could also do something that I don't think we've done before, but um, make some type of requirement related to stormwater management plan um, uh, in advance of the development agreement. However, that may be you know, very difficult to negotiate with a developer because they would have to expend funds without the guarantee of receiving the property after expending those funds. Yeah, true. All right, well, I'm gonna go back to the advisory panel members um, for some further discussion since I don't think we're close to consensus on this one, but I appreciate all the input that we've got both from Mr. George and Mr. Reynolds. Anybody else on the panel want to jump into this discussion? Um, I, I think given the concerns with the community, and I, I hope it's fair that both developers hold these community meetings and um, we address at a later time, but I, I would really like to see like a, a plan for alleviating this um, drainage, not necessarily putting money into them, but at least having a plan so that they're um, aware and comfortable with like where it's going. But, you know, that is, I, I know that um, um, St. Christopher is, is willing to, but Mr. George, I'm hoping you are as well, because I think the education is key um, often and I don't know where everybody else is, but I'm I'm willing to at least allow the community to get that information, give their feedback, and kind of come back to it. I also want to raise the issue um, that was mentioned just on uh, sight lines um, entering and exiting from the site. I think somebody might have mentioned there might be a, a sight line issue for traffic. I'm not 
quite sure I I see it, but um, but there is a bend um, down the road. But just want to put that out there for consideration as well. Besides the stormwater issue, um, anybody on the panel feel strongly one way or another? I mean, I'm still leaning toward um, the St. Christopher proposal just because I think it's the it's the least intensive and probably more beneficial to the neighborhood. Um, I hate losing or not gaining an, an affordable unit, but um, you know, I think that St. Christopher's, I think that use would be the least intensive. Well, I'm going to argue a little bit with you, Lynn, and say that a one bedroom, one bath cottage is probably not that um, intensive. And given the fact that we have a affordable housing crisis and that there's very little, if any, affordable housing in the west, west end of the city, um, I think um, if the stormwater issues can be addressed, I think I'm leaning a little bit in the opposite direction towards the cottage. And I'll but say, I'm, sorry. Go ahead, Phil. I just was going to say, but I want to hear from everybody else. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say, I'll admit, I'm I'm conflicted uh, somewhat. Uh, I appreciate uh, the comments that Mr. George provided. Um, I think both affordable housing and green space are two of my passions, so you can't go wrong. But um, uh after after hearing you know Mr. George's comments, I think I am back towards leaning more towards the staff's recommendation of uh, awarding to Mr. George on you know kind of with conditions of doing the due diligence of uh, some of this you know engineering. Um, I did hear the you know. Uh, the entrance, entry and egress uh, concerns from the neighborhood, from the street. So, you know, in site design, maybe considering a longer driveway than just kind of one car length um, is something to consider. Um, I think, you know, and in Mr. George's proposal, he did also um, contemplate, you know, kind of building in some gardening landscaping a greenhouse whatever you want to call it um so i i think there's opportunity there um also for affordable housing in the west end um so i while i am conflicted somewhat i think i am back towards uh going with the one bedroom um rental um at least at least to allow Mr. George to do the due diligence needed. Okay, thank you, Phil. James? Um, Sharon, can I make a comment? Um, this is John George again. May I address the traffic concern? Certainly, Mr. George. Um, thank you. Um, I have done due diligence with regard to all the current zoning on that property and my proposal fully meets with every single building and zoning requirement that the city currently has. And interestingly enough, the current zoning at that lot does not allow a driveway turning a right angle driveway in the front of that house. It is not allowed, so therefore I wouldn't be proposing one. The parking for that, for my proposal, would be parallel parking. That's the only thing that current zoning allows. So um, the car, there's a long triangular frontage there. There's plenty of room for two cars to pull over and park like you park in the fan district. And it's very easy for a driver who's parked on that side of the road to look in their uh, driver's side rear view mirror and see whether they should pull out. And that is a much, much safer condition than what would be if, a perpendicular driveway were installed. Now, I do know that lots of the neighbors along there have perpendicular driveways, but those are no longer allowed. So my, my project would not have one of those. Okay. And there is an alley in the back, but 
Is that accessible to the back of that lot? Yes, it is, but I don't know how viable it is for vehicular traffic. Okay. So if I heard you correctly, your proposed plan would be sort of off-site parallel parking in front. And no, it's actually be um, on street on the shoulder. I mean, it would be parallel to the right of way. Correct, but it wouldn't be in the right of way. It would be on the property. Oh yeah, it would be it would be beyond the curb line. Right. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that. Okay. Above the curb line. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um panel members. Um haven't heard from James yet. Haven't really heard from Chanel unless I missed something James. in the chat. Yeah. Yeah, James is in the chat saying uh, he's also leaning towards the cottage due to the possible water mitigation solutions uh, for okay. the community and for adding one additional unit of affordable housing. Okay. And Chanel? She also put a comment in, in, um, in the chat. And the only one that I'm seeing is from earlier, which was that she was happy to hear St. Chris is willing to take over the land and use it for the community. Was there something post that comment? Uh, no, I'm sorry. That's the only one I was referencing. Okay. All right. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to scroll through here. So right now, it doesn't look like we have consensus, Flora. Sounds like the panel may be leaning towards the staff's recommendation, but I don't see Chanel um, weighing in and making any changes to her earlier comment supporting St. Christopher's. Um, yeah, if if you'd like, um, if it would be, um, if you you know we can um, I can reach back out uh, after the meeting if you'd like to um not not make a recommendation at this time but rather you know um i can reach out after the meeting and check in with everybody to to get everybody's thoughts and then we can we can reach a consensus over email um okay and i i, I would appreciate that i know it's uh getting late at 7 30 um and i know you wanted to wrap this up is that the will of the citizen advisory panel to sort of leave that particular one open for further contemplation? Um, I might suggest rather than doing the um, vote by email um, after this meeting that the Citizens Advisory Panel agree to come back for a brief meeting um, in the next few weeks. We can do some additional research. Um, there's just a lot of community attention or interest mm -hmm. in that. I think it, a good service to them to do it in a public meeting when we um, have more information and can make a better decision. I'm certainly fine with that. I agree. Thank you, Erica. Me too. Thanks, Erica. I appreciate that. Uh, okay. Then let's go ahead and say we'll do that. Um, I will reach out to y'all and uh, figure out what's a good day that works. Um, and then we will um, we will publicize that once it's all once it's all set up and, and we have all the extra information needed. Okay. Do you is there anything else you need from the panel tonight, Flora? Uh, the other two I think um, didn't have any proposals to them and it looked like ML uh, Maggie Walker was going to take on the development themselves. Yeah, that's correct. Um, okay. We're prepared to do those. All right. Uh, well, in that case, um, thank you all so much. Thanks to all the um, to Sharon and and uh, Sheba, Lynn, Bill, uh, Chanel, and James um, for coming out tonight, and for um, all of our um, members of the public who joined us tonight for um, um, for the the meeting. Um, we will have this recording posted on our YouTube channel um, as well. And we will, um, you know, 
put out an official uh, announcement um, once uh, these recommendations have been reviewed by the board. Um, Chanel is saying in the cap that she's or in the in the chat that she's also leaning towards the the housing, but I think it's a good idea to to do this extra meeting anyway, just so that we can kind of um, you know get everyone get everyone situated. <clears throat> but um, yeah, thank you all again. Um, the board of directors will be reviewing these recommendations next week at their meeting, um, after which um, I'll publicize um, you know all of all of this stuff. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you all very much. Thank you, Flora. All right, y'all have a good evening. All right, take care, everybody. <laughs>